Thank you. A few words on what we mean by verbal category of conditionality. The idea is that we use this as a sort of umbrella term which covers both the grammatical and semantic uh, uh, issues. So there are some verbal forms which are traditionally called as uh, called, called conditional in the descriptions of one language or the other. But also there are semantic fields, I say fields because um, arguably there's more than one, uh, well, a broad semantic field of conditionality which may be expressed by certain verbal forms not necessarily traditionally called that. So to begin with, Slavic languages have a grammatical category which is called a conditional mood. It is inherited from their common ancestors, so it is called that in every Slavic language. It's formed by a special Aris form of the copula that turned a particle in some of the languages where it ceased inflecting for person and number in combination with the, uh, the perfect uh, participle, the so-called L participle of the main verb. So this is a form which exists uh, with minor Differences, I said, uh, in some languages it inflects, in some others it, it uh, does not mean for, for, for person and number. But generally it is part of the common heritage of Slavic languages. On the other hand, there's another widespread verbal category which has a semantic overlap with the Slavic conditional and also shares the name with it because it's uh, it tends to be called a conditional. Uh, it is mostly known at least mostly known to people present in this hall, I assume, but uh, in general, widely known from Western European languages, languages such as English, uh, the Romance languages, but it's also found in a variety of other languages outside of this um, area. Uh, it is a combination of the past and the future. So um, it could be called a past form of the future, a past derivative of the future. And it is uh, traditionally called conditional in the description of most of these languages, but it's, it relates to the future as the past does to the present. Mm. So we see mm, a couple of examples on this slide taken from two Western European languages, as well as one Northeast Caucasian, just to illustrate that. Uh, the phenomenon is more widely encountered. Well, Bulgarian, being a Slavic language, does have the Slavic type conditional mood, and it is called conditional mood in its grammar. It is formed in a way which is common to uh, the other Slavic languages, with the use of, as I said, a special uh, form, a par formerly past tense form of the copula, which is now just a grammatical marker. But Bulgarian also has a category of the verb which is called the future in the past, and is part of the big tense system of Bulgarian. So the future in the past tense, uh, and it's a related tense, which is the future uh, perfect in the past, which is built out of the future with an operation, which in fact corresponds to forming a past tense. So it is very literally, a past form of the future, or at least etymologically before some minor changes happened. So as such, it is exactly parallel or very, very nearly exactly parallel to the form which is called conditional in the grammars of the Western European languages. But Bulgarian has a separate conditional. So how do these two things differ? What is Bulgarian doing having these two categories, which uh, actually on the face of it should be the same. Well, as a matter of fact, sometimes they don't really differ. So it is easy to find sentences which contain both side by side. So here's a, a compound sentence which contains one form of uh, the future in the past tense marked in red color here as on the next uh, slides in this presentation. And then in another cause, it contains uh, conditional mood form marked in green. And the two of them seem to have the same interpretation. So if you look at the meaning of the sentence, it's very hard to find uh, a reason for which the writer used different forms. Well, except for just uh, avoiding repetition in this case. 
which is not always the case. Sometimes you can find examples of uh, a similar use of the two categories in close succession in a text in which it is possible to look at them closely and to find uh, a slight semantic difference to say that, well, the conditional mood has a tendency to express an inclination. So the event might be possible. Uh, whereas uh, the future in the past uh, uh, is a necessary consequence of a condition which is perhaps unexpressed. So here, for example, in this example, which has an English language original, the Bulgarian translator chose to use different forms where English has identical form. So we could find an explanation of why the Bulgarian translator did that. Although, of course, whether this was the case, nobody can know, perhaps not the translator himself either. Well, well, sometimes when the forms are coordinated, again, the future in the past may refer to a time which follows what the conditional refers to. As in this example, for example, many minor events would have remained unnoticed or would have been forgotten, arguably, they are remaining unnoticed, as in the time when they might have been noticed precedes the time when they would have been forgotten, because to forget something, you have to notice it after, beforehand. So possibly there is... Uh, an opposition here, but this is probably not the whole story. Looking at their meanings a bit more closely, uh, how, how, how does it come that the future in the past, what is literal future in the past, structurally future in the past, ends up meaning the same thing as a conditional, or very nearly the same thing? Uh, its primary meaning is in fact temporal. First of all, it is a tense. The future in the past tense, as in a tense which expresses something that is located after a past moment. So in Reichenbachian terms, things might look like this. We have a speech time, which is at the right-hand side. We have a reference time, which is to the left, because in the past. And then we have a future relative to this past, uh, the event time, which actually doesn't have to be past rather to the speech time either. It might be the same as speech time. It might even be after. It tends to be in the past uh, for various reasons. So here we have an example in which the form of the future in the past does have its temporal meaning. It means something that follows what happened before. Actually, it's a, tr a translation from Italian. And in Italian, we see the form that is used is the Italian conditional, uh, but its interpretation is uh, not a conditional, it is it has a temporal interpretation here, despite the fact that it's called something else in traditional grammar. And then there's the counterfactual meaning, the model meaning, which is actually what makes it a conditional, uh, which actually starts life, arguably, again, as a future in the past, except it's future on a different uh, timeline. If you assume a paradigm of branching future, if you say the future branches every time you uh, refer to, to some point, you still have your speech time, you have a reference point which is in the past, and you have an event time which is future relative to the reference time, but it may be located somewhere compared to the speech time, where since there are different axes, uh, the question might not even arise as to which is earlier, which is later, because they don't co-occur in the same universe anyway. But if they did, maybe you could order them somehow. Uh, and actually, you end up in a situation where you have these two forms, of which one is called conditional, the other is not. But which is more conditional is a big question. Okay, over here, these are two examples in one of which the conditional mood is used and in the other one, the future in the past tense. And in fact, what we see is that uh, in the sentence where the speaker says, I would ask you in the conditional, he actually does ask by doing so. So this is in fact a performative use and performative excludes counterfactuality. It's very, very factual. He does in fact ask for this. Whereas in the other one, the other example where I say, I was going to ask to see such and such, he actually does not ask. He never gets around to asking because the phone rings, because something else happens and the events actually take a different course. So in fact, what you see here is that the conditional is factual and the future in the past is counterfactual. 
Anyway, all this means that Bulgarian seems to be overly complex. It has two categories where many languages have only one. One of these categories is very much like a similar category in closely related languages, but it obviously cannot perform the same function because of the simple existence of the other one. And this is a big source of problems uh, for people learning Bulgarian, starting as speakers of other Slavic languages. Actually, my co-author can confirm, I think, from her own uh, um, experience. Um, I hope not so bitter, but still. Um, Instructive. Okay, uh, it it is a it is an issue that comes up with translation, human translation, and machine translation. It is an issue that comes up with uh, when we get grammatical description of the languages and so on. Many situations, theoretical and practical, which is why we decided to look at Bulgarian in close parallel with Ukrainian, as in what co correspondences do these two grammatical forms of Bulgarian. I mean, what, what are the responses in Ukrainian? For this, we use material from our Bulgarian-Ukrainian parallel corpus, which is something that I think many people in this hall have heard about uh, more than once. But anyway, very bri briefly, it is a parallel corpus which is composed of fiction, mostly novels. Uh, it grows, so at present, uh, its total size is uh, over 28 million words jointly in the two languages. Um, yeah, so the, the decimal point is in the wrong place here, actually, it is 15.2 uh, uh, million Bulgarian, 13.4 million Ukrainian. And it's composed of 10 sectors according to the language of the original, and the sectors are of the same size. Now, if we look at all the forms counted together of the two <coughs> or grammatical constructions that Bulgarian has conditional mood and uh, future in the past tense. Uh, one thing that we see is that in half of the corpus, they occur more often. In the other half of the corpus, they occur less often. But on the other hand, in the part of the corpus where they occur less often, they have a Ukrainian counterpart with the use of the Ukrainian conditional moved with greater regularity. And tellingly, they are divided into sectors with a Slavic original language and sectors with a non-Slavic original language, which in itself is very interesting, but we are not going to look at this now because we're going to concentrate on only two sectors out of the 10, so 20% of the corpus, one-fifth, the two sectors uh, which are the Bulgarian original texts and the Ukrainian original texts uh, and their translations into the other language, uh, the so-called direct translations. As I said, it's a design feature of the corpus that all sectors are the same size. So we have the same amount of Bulgarian original text and its translations into Ukrainian, and vice versa. And the first thing that we see is that, all told, in Bulgarian, we have more such forms than, uh, uh, in Bulgarian, that is, we have more such forms in the Bulgarian original text than we have in the Bulgarian translations of Ukrainian texts. Now, looking at the two categories separately, we see that the Bulgarian conditional mood is used a good deal more frequently in original Bulgarian texts than in Bulgarian translations of Ukrainian texts. Uh, when I say a good deal more, I mean uh, one and a half times more, a, a, a factor of three to two, which is quite telling. And most of the time it does have a Ukrainian correspondence with the Ukrainian conditional mood. If we look at the verbs which are used, mm, the one that's number one with a very, very big march is the verb moga, which means can or may. So things like um, expressions like uh, could I, might I, I use very often. Uh, and then the next one is trabvam, be needed. So these two, these modal verbs of possibility and necessity, followed by iskam, want, followed by the copula, followed by the verb kaza, say, uh, and so on, uh, the others are less frequent, a good deal less frequent. 
And what are the Ukrainian counterparts? Well, most of the time it is the Ukrainian conditional mood that we see used here. Uh, most often as in with a, with a huge marge. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the, the next ones uh, are more or less occasionally used. Mm, but the one, well, occasionally still a fair number uh, of present indicatives follow the past indicatives, followed by future indicatives. So generally, uh, tenses of the indicative mood, uh, different tenses. Mind you, there's another use of the conditional mood in Bulgarian, which still exists, it, it is common to the Slavic languages in general, but in Bulgarian, it is, uh, as it seems, on its way out. It is very, very seldom. Um, it it uh, is it sounds obsolete sometimes. Uh, so here is an example in which uh, a Bulgarian writer uses this uh, form, and then uh, it is uh, the, the conditional mood is used in in the condition in antecedent in a conditional sentence. Then we have a future in the past in the consequent. So if something had happened, something else would happen. In, there are only 18 instances in which Ukrainian also uses the conditional mood in this situation, and 18 more in which it does not. But as I said, it's very rare. Looking at the future in the past, we see a rather different situation. The future in the past uh, is uh, used approximately equally, actually very, very nearly exactly the same number of times in Bulgarian original texts and in Bulgarian translations of Ukrainian texts. And if we look at the translations or the Ukrainian originals or the, the corresponding Ukrainian sentence, we see that uh, although uh, with the Bulgarian conditional, uh, the Ukrainian text had a conditional mood uh, with much more frequently than it did not, over here it's about half and half. So Bulgarian uh, future in the past is about as likely to appear in the Bulgarian original text as in a translation from a Ukrainian, and it's about as likely to have a Ukrainian counterpart in the conditional mood as not to. The verbs that are so used are mostly the two copula verbs, which differ in that one of them is perfective and the other one is imperfective, but it's a form of difference which uh, does not really obtain uh, in the future of the past most of the time. So they're more or less uh, identical, except for special occasions. Uh, uh, in, in these forms, uh, uh, in, in their meaning, and they're followed by imam, uh, have, followed by stana, become. So different verbs this time, not the same verbs as the conditional mode so more often used. Uh, counterpart number one is again the, the Ukrainian conditional mode, which is used to render, or then it corresponds to the Bulgarian future in the past. Then the future indicative follows. So, so far, nothing very unusual except for the ratio, because this time the conditional mood does not uh, lead with such a huge marge. I said that in translation, the question of how to render these forms uh, uh, can be problematic sometimes, which indeed it can, because after all, Bulgarian seems to have, uh, as I said, an excessive wealth of forms. So what do Ukrainian uh, translators of Bulgarian texts, for example, do to render the difference that we might see sometimes? Uh, here's an in interesting interplay of moods and tenses in the two texts, Bulgarian and Ukrainian, where the Ukrainian translator attempts to convey the meaning, uh, but in fact says something, strictly speaking, different. So this is part of a Bulgarian novel where the, um, a, a boy's father explains to him that a certain girl from the neighborhood is better, is better than you. And if she were of your age, surely she would be smarter as well. She would be smarter expressed in the future in the past in Bulgarian. Uh, the Ukrainian translator makes the father say something different, uh, literally what he says, uh, when, when she is as old as you are, uh, obviously as you are now, uh, she will surely be smarter. So if you compare the two things, what one says and what the other says, 
the Bulgarian original has a situation in which two universes are compared. Uh, the horizontal line uh, is the real world in which Yulia is younger than Pesho. So uh, Yulia is born later than Pesho. And as a result of which uh, she hasn't become as smart as he is as yet. But in the parallel universe where Yulia is born at the same time as Pesho and they're of the same age now, Yulia is already smarter. And the Ukrainian translator uh, makes all this happen on the same timeline. So what he says is, if Yulia were, oh, I thought, actually, when Yulia is your age, using a future instead of a conditional form, so when Yulia is your age, at future time, when Yulia is of the age that you are now, she'll be smarter than you. So this is a way of conveying a kind of identical, uh, equivalent meaning, shall we say, not identical, but uh, equivalent meaning in, in, with, with the uh, grammatical means that Ukrainian provides. And going back to what I was saying about the forms that Ukrainian translators use to render the meaning of the Bulgarian future and the past, number three is the past tense of a modal verb plus the infinitive of the main verb. Uh, there are several modal verbs which can be used. Uh, uh, the one that is used mostly often is the verb mate, which means have primarily in Ukrainian, but is used in the sense of have to, in the same way as English uh, have is used, have to as, as a need to, of which we see an example here. So I, I went where the show was going to be, which in Ukrainian is literally where it had to be which is followed by the verb hotite, want, uh, and, and several other modal verbs. And sometimes you actually, Ukrainian translators uh, introduce uh, some variety by using different ways of translating the same Bulgarian form. So here we see uh, sort of uh, uh, something like the things that I showed in the beginning of this presentation, only the other way around. Uh, here, Bulgarian has the same form, and Ukrainian has different forms for well, reasons of uh, probably stylistics. Uh, the Ukrainian translator wanted to, uh, to escape having to repeat the form because it's stylistically uh, sometimes frowned upon. Although Bulgarian author used the same form in the two, in the two cases. Why is uh, the thing that I mentioned last of particular interest, the fact that Ukrainian often use a past tense of a modal verb with the infinity of the main verb? Well, because this is how such forms come into being. We have seen it in the making of the Ukrainian synthetic future, which is actually an exact parallel of the synthetic future of the present day Romance languages, like uh, French or Italian, uh, in, in which uh, uh, the, what used to be the infinitive of uh, well, Latin melted together with a verb. Uh, yes, exactly. And it made a synthetic future. Uh, and Ukrainian has done exactly the same thing with its own means. Uh, and also we know that the future in the past tense are conditional with the Western European languages is born in the same way. So maybe we have a mood in the making here. And then the other thing that's interesting to look at are the asymmetries in the translation of tenses and moods. So, for example, that you see at the pair Ukrainian present tense and Bulgarian conditional mood, its, uh, uh, its frequency is different in the two sectors, which seems to mean that in Bulgarian, the conditional mood uh, has in the mind of many writers and translators transferred into a form which is mostly used for softening the, the expression. So softening uh, uh, a statement about a possibility or necessity or something like that. And this is something that the Bulgarians do when they write. Ukrainians don't bother rendering it when they, when they translate. And Ukraine, Bulgarian translators from Ukrainian don't bother supplying it when it does not exist in the original either. On the other hand, the Ukrainian conditional used for rendering the Bulgarian future in the past less frequently than in the opposite direction. This is something for which you don't have uh, an explanation. Maybe the stylistic of the text has something to do with it. Anyway, this deserves further study, as does the Ukrainian conditional mood and its counterparts in Bulgarian, but well, uh, some other time about this. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>